right, well, let's get started with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, today and um, just the opportunity to come before you and study your word. Lord, we just, uh, we thank you for this revelation you've given us. God, thank you for the opportunity to vote. And we just pray that um, that your will would be done and that you would uh, that you would be gracious to America and that you would give us opportunity to serve you. And God, we pray for the church in America that you would stir us up to a newness of life for proclaiming your word in this country that has started to forget about you, God, and has started walking away from you and has started to participate in Babylon. So God, help us as we... Uh, we go through this season, help us use our voice how we can to uh, advance your kingdom uh, here on this earth right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, let's see where we at here. Mystery Babylon. <laughs> All right, so if you remember last week, we had started in chapter 17. Um, for any of you that weren't here, uh, we had just finished wrapping up the bowls in chapter 16. The bowls of God's complete wrath were being poured out. And after that last bowl of wrath had been poured out and it was proclaimed from a voice in heaven saying, it is done, it is finished, God's wrath is finished, we have one of those angels at the beginning of chapter 17 that is now giving John an additional vision of Babylon the harlot, the last bowl of judgment that was poured out on Babylon, John is now getting this additional image, this, this angel that had this bowl wants to give him more information. So we were, we were going through Babylon and that imagery of Babylon, and uh, I thought I was going to get through the whole chapter, and uh, I, I made it through like five verses. So we're going to hopefully finish this chapter up this week, and then next week we're going to start on chapter 18, because the next question shows up in chapter 18, and it's all tied together. Babylon is talked about in both of these chapters, um, and so that's where we're sort of going to be going next week, but I want to wrap up a little bit of this, uh, of this section here, um, just since there's a lot of unfinished things about it that uh, we can go through still. Um, so... So looking at this, uh, well, let's just read the rest of this chapter again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in verse 6, Revelation 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman, and again, this is Babylon the harlot, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast. And he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings... Five have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have not received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast." These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those who are with him are the called and the chosen and faithful. And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So now that that is cleared up, we'll just go back through and talk about this a little, a little slower. So 
We had talked about, um, we, we had finished off in verse 5, where we were talking about mystery. And if, uh, if you missed that from last week, you'll have to go back and look at it. But I was going through the idea of mystery in specifically uh, Revelation and then also in, uh, in Paul's writing, where it talks about those coming into Christ as this mystery that's going to be completed. So, so that was the mystery that I was talking about that God has, that he's bringing to a completion. And we didn't get very much into the mystery aspect of Babylon. I sort of, it was like right at the end, I looked up and it was like, I don't know what it was, uh, 943 or something. So I had two minutes. So <laughs> I didn't do a very good job. So I'm, I'm picking up, we are, I forget what the sub point is on this. Hopefully you can see where it is there. I, I, on the printouts, I have it just sort of starting at the top. So I beefed up the handouts that I had a little bit for this second section. Um, so we're starting out on this satanic mystery counterfeit. So, you know, thinking about God who has his mystery that's being completed and unified and people are being brought into Christ through faith and uh, this mystery is going to be presented and Paul in Ephesians 5 describes it as a, this mystery of Christ and the church being brought together like a bride so this is God's mystery that's being completed. Now you've got this satanic mystery of this woman, Babylon. And we had, I had read through 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, but we hadn't uh, talked about it very much. I sort of blitzed right past it. So I want to spend just a little bit more time talking about this. So uh, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. And just to stop for a second here to try to lay out a little bit of this. So Paul is, Paul is describing um, some of the things that are going to be happening before the return of the Lord in this section in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the description is that this lawless one or this sinful one will be revealed at that point, and the Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth. Now this, if you're familiar with Revelation, this sounds a lot like Jesus coming back on his white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth in chapter 19, where he destroys the Antichrist. So there's a little bit of imagery that sh should be paralleling a little bit here. Uh, bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So again, this is talking about Christ's coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. So a, a lot of people will identify this person, this man of sin, as the Antichrist because of, because of this sort of association right here. The one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. And you see that and you should be thinking about that false prophet that we saw back in chapter 13, this beast of the earth who had risen up who was deceiving and using false signs and wonders to convince the earth dwellers to follow him uh, and again we saw this even in chapter 16 right at the end before this gathering of the kingdoms of the earth and these armies to be gathered together for the battle of armageddon there were those frogs that were coming out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet and satan the dragon to deceive the armies of the earth to bring them together so I think a lot, what I'm trying to just point out here is that this section has a lot of similarities to what we've seen in Revelation so far and what we will see. And with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. And again, that's that giving over or hardening that we talked about from Romans chapter 1 and what we've seen with Pharaoh in the Exodus stories, this hardening that God will give people over to. So the reason I bring this up is at the beginning here, it's called the mystery of lawlessness. And that idea is sinfulness. So lawlessness is, you know, anything that's against the law, the, the, the covenantal law that God has given out that is, you know, describing what is sin and what is what is holy 
So this woman, this description that's being used of her is that she is a mystery as well. And as you look at this description of her, we're going to see that she's drunk on the blood of the saints. You can see this wickedness that is filled up in her. And as we get into chapter 18, we're going to look at this wickedness even more. But the call is going to be that her sins have piled up to heaven and they can't be ignored anymore. And so what I'm trying to point out with this is that Babylon is, a so is this association of this mystery of sin that's been building and building and building. And now you have this culmination that's going to be judged in chapter 18. You're going to see this judgment that's going to have to fall on her because this sin, this mystery of lawlessness is achieving its completion. So we're going to see the completion of the mystery of God which is the culmination of the church and being brought into the body of Christ through his faith. And you're going to see this mystery of lawlessness, sin building and building and building to the point that God is going to have to judge it. And this is being personified in uh, Babylon, the harlot right now. So hopefully that's making sense. Uh, another section that's worth checking out uh, in Zechariah 5 verses 5 through 11. I'm not going to go there but you can check it out. This is Zechariah, so this is post-exile. You know, you've got a prophet back in the land of Israel that's been released from Babylon, and he sees this woman called wickedness being carried off into the land of Shinar, which is another description of the land of Babylon, and she's placed on a pedestal there where she's worshipped. And so there's some interesting imagery there. You're welcome to check that out. It's a uh, it's, it's got some similarities to this as well, but this idea of this woman that's known as wickedness in the land of Babylon. So you start getting these strong associations that this has you know, been described before. This is not some New Testament thing that God has not revealed to his prophets before. So what we're going to see, uh, what we should be thinking about is that we've got the harlot Babylon, and her end is going to be consumption. She's going to be consumed and destroyed and left desolate. And that's the picture you see of her here is that she's in a desolation. She's in a wilderness. But the wife is going to result in a consummation. And when we get to the new Jerusalem coming down, we're going to look at Isaiah 62. And specifically in that chapter in Isaiah 62, it describes, it describes this wife as no longer being desolate, but being married. And so just this beautiful imagery that we're going to start seeing as this compare and contrast. And, uh, and John the Baptist had a little bit of insight into this, but he, he describes himself as not being, you know, he's like, if you don't have the bride, then you're not the bridegroom. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. And he's talking about the disciples starting to follow Jesus. And we're going to see at the end that, you know, God's dwelling is with men, with his bride. So... You know, these, these ideas have been going through the entire story of Scripture from the very beginning. I mean, thousands of years apart, you've got a consistent message that continues to be describing these mysteries that are going to be completed. Uh, and the other the description that we get in verse 6 is that she's drunk on the blood of the saints. And, you know, when I, when I think about this, I mean, we've seen this this idea of martyrs that have been going on throughout the book. If you look, you know, it's Revelation 6, we see these martyrs under when the fifth seal is open. In Revelation 7, you see the tribulation saints. In Revelation 13, you know that the beast is going to be martyring people. In Revelation 14, the Holy Spirit is pronouncing a blessing on martyrs from this point on. And in Revelation 15, you see martyrs in heaven who have overcome the beast. It's martyrs, it's martyrs, martyrs, they've overcome. This woman, Babylon, is the one who is being ascribed to the blood of these martyrs. She is drunk on the blood of the saints. And if you look at uh, Revelation 18, verse 24, it describes this again. It says, it was found in her the blood of the prophets and the saints and all slain on the earth. I mean, this, this image you should get is that she is this bloodthirsty woman who desires nothing less than getting inebriated. And if you think about this, uh, this description of drunkenness, like if you've ever been around alcohol, if you've ever seen images of parties or participated them yourself at some point, this idea of parties that are out of control is the idea of you're drinking, it's feeling good, and then you just keep going at a certain point, 
you're doing more, you're out of control, you keep going with it, and th this building sense of not inhibiting yourself, but pursuing something beyond, beyond what it should be pursued to is this idea of this woman and her martyrdom that she is pursuing with the people of God. So think about this from a satanic motivation. This martyrdom feels good. Think about the kingdom of Satan versus the kingdom of God. So kingdom of, kingdom of God, you know, we're living in peace. We want unity. We want to follow God's laws. We want prosperity. And this woman, on the contrast, is rejoicing in the oppression and the destruction of the people of God because I think as it describes at the end of uh, you know, that John 3.16 passage, they hated darkness rather than light. And you've got this clash that's going on. And what you're seeing with this woman, Babylon, is that she would rather keep pursuing to the nth degree the destruction of God's people than stopping or halting. It's like it's this you know, catastrophic spiral that's going on with her uh, to a destructive end. And that's including the people of God. We're going to see her destruction in at the end of uh, chapter 19. Sorry, 19 verse 2. Revelation 19 verse 2. Because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So chapter 18, you get this pronouncement of destruction and you see these people of the earth lamenting over Babylon's destruction and in in verse 19 you see this celebration in heaven because God has destroyed this harlot who is drunk on the blood of the saints so now in heaven you have this worship because God has finally dealt with this bloodthirsty destruction and kingdom that has been allowed to reign on the earth and what happens is, uh, is a song. You get, and so when you see chapter 19, don't think that it's a new section. It's a continuation and complete, completion of chapter 18 and the destruction of Babylon. It's a rejoicing of God's people because finally God has put an end to Babylon. So there is an end for her. But do you see in 19 verse 2 here that the, that the, the judgment is because she was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Babylon is going to be avenged because her end is this bloodthirsty seeking after this. And, and again, just drunkenness, it's feeling good. For her, for the kingdom of darkness, it feels good to oppress the things of God because it stands in opposition to darkness. You start losing reason. You start losing control. You lack the ability to make good choices. You lack the ability for discernment when you're drunk. And this is what is going on in the kingdom of Babylon as far as opposing the things of God and the people of God. So I think a gorging is that type of description of this drunkenness that this woman has. It's a spiritual gorging on, on you know, Christianity or those who follow Christ. Um, now, the question that gets asked in uh, verse 7 is, why do you wonder? So John is just like blown away by this image. He's just shocked. He's like marveling. It's just, it's shocking. And he's had a couple other things where, you know, he's seen other great and marvelous signs. One of them was just in the previous chapter. He saw God's bowls of final wrath, and he said they were great. It's a great and marvelous sign that God's judgment is coming. But here you see him with this wonder and marvel over this horror that is Babylon. It's, it's that shocking. It's equally shocking what has been going on on the earth through this kingdom of Babylon. Uh, and fortunately, God is going to judge it. But, but the angel says to him here, I'm going to tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast that carries her and the seven heads and the ten horns. And, and so you think that this is going to be a really clear explanation, and it doesn't sound very clear at all. So verses 8 through 14, I had read this, so I don't want to, like, I'll, I'll go through, I'm going to point out a couple different things on this, but uh, as, we go th as we go through this, uh, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time trying to describe what all these heads and kings are. A couple things I want to leave with you as I read through this. 
Um, uh, this description is used a couple times that this uh, beast is a king and it's killed, but he's alive. Like if you look at verse eight right there, you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. So this is talking about the Antichrist. This type of language is used in chapter 13 uh, where the beast comes up out of the abyss and it's a head that was wounded as if dead, but then has been brought back to life. So as you see this, this is talking about Antichrist when you see that imagery coming up. Uh, we get these complicating factors of the seven heads are mountains, but they're also kings. And one of them is the beast, uh, which is resurrected. So if, if you think that this is going to be this really straightforward uh, understanding of what all is going on here, it's really not. So you've got seven heads. They're mountains that this city sits on, but they're also kings. So you've got like already two layers of interpretation that is like hitting you here. Um, the other complicating factor with this is a lot of people, if you look at Daniel chapter 7, and I gave you a couple verses you can look at with this, but these kings often represent kingdoms. So do you assume that these 10 kings are just kings, or are they supposed to be representing kingdoms? So in the premillennial world, most of the time we view this as kingdoms, because if you're assuming that this was a king, one of them currently is. So this start, it starts getting really complicated really fast. And my point with all this is I'm probably not going to spend a bunch of time on this because to really go through trying to analyze which king and what king and who, I, I don't really think that's the point of this. I do think there will be a time in history where you'll be able to look at this and you'll be like, okay, I, I see what's going on here with these kings or kingdoms. It's, it's going to be really clear. I don't feel like I have enough time to invest in all the political stuff or the roots of these kingdoms. Like it really is just a huge investment if you want to try to get into trying to identify all of these and who they're going to be when or, or what. And the question is, could you even do that? Is that even something that we will be able to identify before that comes? So I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this. There's a couple of other things that I'd rather spend some time on. But um, let's go, let, I'm just going to go through this really quick here uh, on, the, on the text section here. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. So this is the Antichrist, just a description of the Antichrist if you go back to chapter 13. Uh, and those who dwell on the earth whose name have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. And so if you, again, if you go back to chapter 13, he has a head that appears to have died but then is brought back to life and the whole world is wondering and awe and following this beast this is the same the same language same type of description that's going on here so i'm trying to tie these together because i think they're talking about the same stuff uh, here is the mind which has wisdom not mine uh, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits and they are seven kings five have fallen one is and the other is not yet come but when he comes he must remain a little while so this is just a description of kings or kingdoms. So, so this, if you look at verse 10 here, this is, this is, again, you have a major parting of ways on how you view this book. So five have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Now, if you take this, you know, let's say we're, you know, thinking back to Charlie's class a long time ago, uh, talking about Israel, he was talking about historical grammatical method of interpretation. Who is the, you know, who is this written to? Who is this being described to? If we're taking this to John in his day, it's, it says five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. So depending on if you believe this is written to John, if you take this as literal kings, you're going to say this was one of the emperors during that time period. So if you take an early date, now you say it's Nero. If you take a late date, you would say this is Domitian. This causes a number of problems because... The Caesars, there were more Caesars than just seven of them. So we start, it starts becoming complicated when you start taking that just as kings. If you take it as kingdoms, uh, I think it makes a little more sense because you've got five kingdoms, and this would be looking at, you know, the Babylonian kingdom, the kingdom of Persia, the kingdom of Greece, and then the kingdom of Rome, which be, would be the king that now is. Um, and then you're going to be expecting a future kingdom. So that's what a lot of like future premillennials, our church would probably be more in line with a lot of that type of thing. Um, 
So just to give you, like, this is a, there's a major parting of ways when you hit this verse on how people start taking this. So I'm not going to give you, like, a great answer other than to say, like, I think this was talking about the kingdom that John was dealing with in that day and age. So I think this is speaking about the Roman kingdom that currently is. So I think we're looking at yet future things with the other that has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a while longer. So, again, people will spend, like, you have people that will spend ministries on this, like, months just talking about these kingdoms. So, uh, we, could, we could devote a bunch of time to it, but I just, uh, it's not really, it doesn't do much to advance, like, the questions that we're going through. So, I'm just going to, like, pass and punt on that. <laughs> uh, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have not yet received a kingdom, but that they, they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So if you have anyone take away, any takeaway with this, the idea is that there's a centralizing of power that's going to be going on that's going to be given to this beast, the Antichrist. So that should be your takeaway with this. Like, it's fun to look at all the other intricacies of this, but the takeaway should be the Antichrist is going to have this power. The purpose of all these kings, kingdoms, is to centralize this power. So you hear oftentimes about a one-world government, things along those lines. This would be that type of thing. The kingdom of Satan, that mystery of wickedness, is now manifesting itself like the kingdom of God manifests itself. Now you've got this concentration of mystery Babylon that's now concentrating itself with the beast or the Antichrist at its head. Is that making sense? Okay. Um, this, there is a, a description of destruction. And I want to just jump ahead to this really quick. This is in the interpretive part of the, of the book, the last three verses. But in verse 16, it says, The ten horns which you saw and the beast, they will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. So if you thought this was going somewhere, it takes a radical turn, doesn't it? Like you see Satan's kingdom being built up. And it doesn't even say God is doing this destruction. We know that ultimately this is God's judgment from other sections. But the point of this section is that these kings that gave power to the Antichrist build her up, and then they hate her and destroy her. They make her desolate and naked, and she's burned with fire and totally destroyed. So this is like the kingdom of Satan. It's turning on itself. It's a self-destructive force. So do you see how quickly it just comes to an end? Like these alliances, like you think about alliances, some of those stories in the Old Testament where these groups are unifying against Israel or Judah, and then, you know, like that story with Gideon, and they just break pots and blow trumpets, and then all these combined forces turn on each other and destroy themselves. It, this is, to me, it sounds like the same type of principle that's going on here. Oh, did we lose everything? Yeah. Okay, we're down, to, we're down to one. Not even the Word of God, just my notes. Did they overheat? I just touch your screen there. Yeah. Maybe, it'll come back. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe uh, talking about destruction, Peter, here you go. You know? Spirit of Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> so I bring that up because oftentimes you'll see this in the kingdom of Satan. You've got this symbiotic relationship, this kingdom of Babylon is growing, it's gaining thing uh, things from its uh, let's see. Is that on? Is the, is the projector on? I'm just wondering if, if both of those went off or if it's just... Uh, they were never on? Really? Yeah. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for letting me know. I mean, it's not like we need the scripture anyway. I'll just go with my notes. Um, so anyway, uh, so, so what you're seeing with all of this is that this, this power is centralized. You've got this relationship between these kings, the Antichrist, and this city of Babylon, this 
this kingdom of Satan. And what I want to point out is these kingdoms, when you think about Babylon, a city is only a city if you have people in it. A kingdom is only a kingdom if it's made up of people, right? So this beast, the Antichrist, is going to turn on this kingdom. It's going to turn on this city and destroy it. It has no problem destroying its own citizens. And that's like Satan, right? I, I think about that story of the, the demon-possessed man, the parable that Jesus tells, this, this demon-possessed man, and uh, he gets his spirit cast out, but without anything filling that house, you get more coming back and, and reaping destruction on it. And, and I see that type of a thing occurring here. You've got this parasitic, it's, it's like this symbiotic relationship. You've got these people that are part of this kingdom, they're getting something out of it. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's symbiotic to start with. And then you, you see that the beast is taking power and authority. So now it's starting to become parasitic where you know the beast is taking things from this kingdom and then ultimately it ends in her, in her destruction so all these people are going to get destroyed following that um i don't think there's anything i can do to get that thing going did it come back you got one of them okay But this beast is going to take power and then destroy Babylon. And uh, I think of this expression. Uh, do you, I don't know if you guys are all Lord of the Rings. Do you, it, it, in the two towers in Lord of the Rings, you've got Gandalf, and he's supposed to be like buddies with his other ally, this, uh, the, the leader of the wizards, uh, Saruman, who's you know, got this tower. And uh, Saruman, it turns out, has uh, decided he's going to share allegiance with the evil dude Sauron. And so he actually turns against Gandalf. And I don't know if you remember, uh, Gandalf makes this statement to him. He says, he will not share his glory with another. He's rebuking Saruman. He's like, you made the wrong alliance. This alliance that you chose, you don't think you're going to get betrayed? You're like joining forces with the evilest guy in the land? You don't think you're going to get betrayed with this? And actually, that, that expression, he will not share his glory with another, that's taken from Isaiah. So you know Tolkien was a, a devout Catholic. Um, but God, does, God says that of himself. I'm God. I won't share my glory with another. Well, guess what? Satan's the same way. You think he's going to share his glory or his power with anybody in his kingdom? He's not there for their you know, success. He's there for their destruction. And so as I, I think about this, and maybe we'll just stop here for a minute, we can, if you guys have any comments on this mystery Babylon or any of that stuff, um, but just thinking about this, like, are there any areas of your lives where you have bought into Babylon, you've bought into sin? Like, it's hard to take a step back and think about this. We're going to spend a lot more time on this next week, too, so if you want to mull it over and bring it back up, there's a call for God's people to come out of Babylon. And that's where we're going to start next week in chapter 18. But that would imply that God's people are participating in Babylon to some degree or at certain times. And so it's, I just think, highly appropriate for us to think about in what ways are we participating in this system on our own? These lusts, these things of power that we get from you know, participating in Babylon in this, you know, sin or lusts or power, wealth that we get from it, as opposed to the things that we get from the kingdom of God. So I'll just pause for a minute if anybody has any comments they want to make. Is that, we got Ron here, Tim. I can't help but think also this really echoes uh, in Jeremiah. You point out that really in, in the end of Jeremiah, he's going do judgments on the nations. He goes nearby and then he reaches out. To, he saves the best for last, <laughs> which is Babylon. But uh, in, in chapter 51, and there's echoing this, he says, flee from the midst of Babylon. Each of you escape with his life. Remember, being depopulated. Mm -hmm. Do not be silenced by her iniquity, the female, for this is Yahweh, I'm reading Legacy Standard, uh, Yahweh's time of vengeance he is going to render recompense to her 
Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of Yahweh, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore, the nations are going mad. And suddenly, Babylon has fallen. It's broken. I can go on. Yeah. It's, well, it's, he's so, again, he's so invested in the Old Testament here. But we're getting a pretty good preview of Yeah. This. And, and we're going to spend, actually, I have devoted, like, next time, we're already going to read through probably half of the chapter of uh, 50 and 51 in Jeremiah. So get our scholar ahead of the, ahead of the curve here. I'm in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 51, kind of uh, verses uh, 6 through about, you can go through about 12 or 13 or so. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, and I would encourage you, if you start in Jeremiah 50, just look at the heading on this here, Prophecy Against Babylon. So 50 and 51 are, 51 I think is uh, that call, come out of her my people in when we get to this next chapter in Revelation, that's going to be where we're pulling from because it's almost a direct quote. So both chapter 50 and 51, if you've got some time for reading, read both of those for next week because we're going to read a lot of them. Um, all right, back to the regularly scheduled program. Um, yeah. Yeah. question about what will lead you to fire and consumption makes me think of the passage about um, our works that will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. Mm -hmm. I was at a memorial service yesterday for my next door neighbor's mom. She was 102 years old when she passed away. Wow. And a woman of prayer I had never seen before like her. And there were over 100 people smashed into this little spangled community church to honor this woman. And all of the people that were there were talking about how Mildred Beitzel was a woman of prayer. And until the day she passed away, her hands were in the air and she was praising the Lord and bringing people to the throne of grace, you know, um, on their behalf. And I thought about that. It was real convicting for me because I thought the things of this world have drawn me away from a commitment to prayer the way Mildred Beitzel had. And I thought, that's going to be wood, hay, and stubble that's going to burn up. I need to recommit my life yeah. to being a woman of prayer like that. Yeah. Yeah, you think how much time we can waste on things that don't matter at all. Surfing through the internet or Pinterest. That's not one of mine, but <laughs> maybe some of you women can identify with Pinterest. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you just think about that comment from Jesus, you know, store up treasures where moth and rust don't destroy, thieves don't break in and steal. Any other comments, thoughts? Bill, Bill, get that man a microphone. You mentioned last week, uh, you read the scripture, the, the verses that talk about Babylon and wilderness. And if we only knew with what was being shared here, uh, how quickly we enter into those things that have no substance. The only substance is what's of Christ. And as we enter into him and live from him, we have true joy and true satisfaction and true purpose. But when we let the world, the world system, which is Babylon, which began in the garden, and it has it has rivaled the, the message of the gospel all down through the ages. Mm -hmm. And when we allow it to turn anything in that, to turn our hearts from God, to live our lives enjoying things, but without reference to him. Mm -hmm. He's given us all things richly to enjoy in a relationship with him, not out of that. But when those things begin to become the idol of our heart and they pull us away, and as we said, we can waste so much time in things that have nothing to do with, with our purpose in life. That's all Babylon, and it's all wilderness. It's 
all desert that has no water, that has no life. Yeah. And I believe that's what he's talking about. This has been the rival of the gospel. Yeah. And, uh, and it's going to be destroyed. The gospel of Christ. Praise God. Yeah, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, that makes me think, too, you were talking about, you know, being in a, in a desolation or a wilderness. And I just, I think about the Exodus again, too, and it's like the whole reason they were stuck in that wilderness for 40 years was because they were grumbling and unhappy because all they could think about were the melons and the cucumbers. And, I mean, I wouldn't be thinking of cucumbers myself, but, you know, just like they were thinking about those earthly things. as a, And so instead of actually achieving a land flowing with milk and honey, here they are stuck in a desolation where they're wandering and are dealing with serpents and, you know, just, you know, you just see that comparison. And, and I think we're going to see that here too. Here's Babylon and she's, it's like that same thing. She's in a wilderness. She's desolate. But you've got, and you know, you think of the promised land, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. But you look at the new Jerusalem and you've got the water of life flowing out of it and you've got the tree of life bearing fruit every month in its season on both sides of this river. And, you know, what city do you want to be in? You know, just this prosperity that God has for you versus this lust that pulls you into this desert that really has nothing sustaining for you at all. It, it will be destroyed. So, uh, and we're going to spend so much time when we get to uh, the New Jerusalem because it's just got so many beautiful promises like that that come together. It's just going to be great. But um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so this last uh this last verse here, starting this last section, uh, verse 14, these will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings and those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. Now, this is a beautiful promise. So like, this is the stuff I want to get into. But um, so this should make you think back to, so th these, these kings, we're just talk, coming out of this section talking about kings they want to wage war with the lamb. And if you go back just one chapter, do you remember those deceiving spirits are coming out as frogs out of the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet, and they're deceiving the nations to assemble them in an army for the battle of Armageddon, right? And we don't hear a lot about it beyond that point. But this is the description of what this whole culmination of antichrist achieving this power, this is that description of this war that's going to happen. So they've been deceived through this Babylon system to fight the lamb. And hopefully you're starting to see this, you know, pitting of Babylon against the kingdom of God. Like, you know, you're seeing her drunk on the blood of the martyrs. And now you're seeing this final war that's going to result where they're actually going to try to make a war against Christ himself. Uh, but look at the, the confidence and the assurance that's given here. The lamb's going to overcome them because he's the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Don't forget the identity of the person they're trying to fight. There's no comparison. This is God in the flesh that they're trying to fight. A demon can't compete with that, right? So um, this description of Lord of lords and king of kings, that's, in, that's Christ's name when he comes back. So again, we're, this is foreshadowing this final battle that you're going to see in chapter 19. So this battle against the lamb, uh, against the Lord of lords and the king of kings, this is, you're going to see it in chapter 19, verse 16. Uh, now this, this idea of those who are with him, and I, I just, you know, to, to maybe make some spiritual application in our own lives right now. Um, We saw in the 144,000 earlier in chapter 14, it says they're on Mount Zion, and it says they're following the Lamb wherever he goes. And here it is again, this description of those who are with the Lamb. There's those that are going to be with him, following him, who are with him, and they're called and chosen and faithful. And 
I just, I think it's such a beautiful image of our walk with God because that's the Christian call is to be walking in lockstep with the lamb, right? This is the call of the Christian to daily walk with him, daily be in prayer with him, daily be listening to the guidance of the spirit in our lives and advancing his kingdom. Um, and this, uh, this idea of called and chosen and faithful, uh, this call goes out to everyone. And if you think about this, uh, if you go to Matthew chapter 22, I, I want to go here quickly so you can see that this, same, this exact same language is used, and it's used of a wedding. Um, and this is a parable that Jesus gives. So this is Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Ding, 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 ding. Like, we're going to be seeing a bunch of that at the end of Revelation. He sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those who murdered and set fire to the, set their city on fire. Again, ding, 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 like we're seeing some of that with Babylon, right? And he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both the evil and the good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So that idea that this call, it's going out to those who are invited first, and then it's going out to like everybody and asking them to come in. But there's this idea that you should be appropriately dressed. And the beauty of looking at this mystery of Christ in the church is that there's this appeal to be dressed in the righteousness of Christ. And we've seen that throughout the book. So I'm not going to keep belaboring all this pure white clothing that keeps showing up in Revelation this time around. But hopefully you can recall some of those passages that we've looked at before. That this call is to be appropriately dressed for when we are called uh, and to keep our garments clean. That was the letter to the church in Sardis from chapter 3. And so this call is going out to everyone. Um, but that choosing... Like, there's a responsibility for us to, to follow what Christ has called us to. And so, um, this faithfulness is, again, uh, called, chosen, faithful. That idea of faithfulness, you think about a marriage relationship, being faithful to someone, being committed to them, uh, following with them, and having a consistent relationship. Um, and so I just think, you know, you know, we think about this lamb, this lamb waging war. We're actually in this war even now. So, you know, we're going to see this play out at the end of time. But more importantly, right now in our own lives, the lamb has been waging war against the kingdom of Satan. We're called to take ground against him. And we're not on our own with this. Christ is right there with us. But so just, you know, think about what areas of your life can you... Can you wage war against the enemy and take ground for God away from Satan? Uh, I think those, are, those are the practical sides of this equation when you start thinking about spiritual warfare. And if you're doing it in your own strength, you're obviously not going to be able to pull anything off. Like, the only reason these people have any power is because they're associated with Jesus Christ, the Lamb, the Word of God, right? They're right next to him. They are with him. So it's just, it's a beautiful thing. Um, these last verses here, um, we've sort of talked about those, but the, the last thing I wanted to talk about is verse 17 here. Oops, I'm in Matthew still. 
let's get back to Revelation 17. So the last thing I want to talk about is this last verse here. For God has put in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. So you see this, the Antichrist turn on this beast, babble on this harlot in this system, and it gets destroyed. But seven, chap, uh, verse 17 tells us, for God has put in their hearts to execute his purpose. This is God's plan. This is actually God's judgment. You see this seemingly self-destruction, but it's God's judgment. Um, and again, I just want to point out, this is just like what happened in the Exodus plagues, right? We had spent time talking about hardening the Pharaoh's heart. This is the same type of thing that goes on, uh, that God is able to take a wicked people or a wicked nation and use them to achieve his right, righteous purpose. So his purpose is going to be the ultimate destruction of Babylon, and he's going to use the enemy to accomplish his task. When you look at Jeremiah 18, and I, I want to go there for just a minute here, this is, the, uh, this is the parable of the potter. I'm sure you guys have heard of this before. But I want to read this for you because I think this describes to a T what's going on here. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. So he's talking to the nation of Israel as a whole here. He's speaking to Israel as a whole. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot or pull down or destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I had planned to bring on it. So the idea is God is a potter. If he sees that something's going on with his vessel, but there's this repentance that happens, God can hold off on his judgment on a nation like that. And this is where I think America is at right now. We're at this turning point. Are we going to turn as a nation and repent of the wickedness and evil that we are calling on ourselves, this judgment we're calling on ourselves? You know, it, we look a lot like Babylon if you look at the United States of America right now. We need to turn before we get destroyed, right? At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot or pull down or destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Or in another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good which I had promised to bless it. So, this is specifically being targeted to Israel. They're thinking like, we've got temple worship. We've got all this stuff. Everything's fine. We've got the promises of God. He gave us this land promise. He gave us this worship. He gave us the covenants. He gave us the scriptures. We can sin as much as we want because we're the chosen people. And what is God telling them here? No, if you're not following my, my law, if you're not following, if you're not participating in my kingdom and the purposes I have for you, you don't get those promises. You get the consequences of sin. So, so here he is describing this. So now then, speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity against you and devising a plan against you. O oh, turn back each of you from his evil ways and reform your ways and your deeds. And this, this section keeps going. We could talk about this, but I'm basically out of time right now. But the point I want to make is Babylon is unrepentant. You have the kingdom of Babylon that is completely unrepentant. And so when we look at this passage from Jeremiah, God has sculpted these kingdoms to be judged. He's taken these kingdoms that have rejected him, are fully encompassing this Babylonian system, and he is using them to show his righteous judgment. 
because they're refusing to repent. And as Bill was pointing out, these kingdoms have existed. You've had the kingdom of God and people wanting to be in fellowship and relationship with God from the beginning. And you've had this Babel system from the very beginning. And these two have been against each other. And you've seen through history, through the story of the Bible, through history, how God has judged individual nations and individual cities that have been wicked. You think of Tyre and Nineveh and, you know, all these different ones. Now you're seeing Babylon as a system is unrepentant. And what is God going to do with this? There is an ultimate judgment where as we get to the end of Revelation, you're going to see there is a new system. There will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more weeping. That system of sin is going to be done away with once and for all. And what you're seeing here is God's purpose of complete judgment being done to Babylon and it being destroyed. And he's using its own unrepentance to destroy it. So if you take away anything from this today, that's probably the best thing you can take away. And the call is going to be, because we're going to roll right into this next chapter, and this next chapter is going to be a call to separate. And the reason that there's a call to separate, and obviously there's a call to separate today, you know, individually, but there's going to be a complete call because a new heaven and a new earth is going to be created and where righteousness dwells, as it says in whatever it is, 1 Peter 5. And that new heaven and new earth and that place where righteousness dwells, sin cannot dwell. This is an ultimate division that's going to happen. And you have to choose what kingdom you want to be part of. And so God is showing you his judgment. He's giving it over to this purpose. If you're participating in that type of system, you are choosing to be given over into the end that sin demands. There's no way that these two kingdoms can exist together this final judgment will be dealt out and it's going to be a complete separation. So the last thing I want to bring up is there is hope. So you think about this imagery and hopefully you got some of that hope from Jeremiah, right? The call is he's, look at him, look at his call in verse 11. Oh, turn back each of you from your evil ways and reform your ways and your deeds. It's not like you can't do this. The call is going out to you so that you will. The danger is that if you don't, you're going to harden your heart and you're going to block yourself from being able to get out of that kingdom and step out of that kingdom. Paul describes the same thing in 2 Timothy 2 verse 20. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, so pure honorable vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And again, this clothing imagery of the bride is that she's clothed with the righteous deeds of the saints. That's this marriage supper of the lamb. That's the description. The bride has prepared herself with the righteous deeds of the saints. The call is to repent and be honorable. And how are you honorable? You're, you're, you're purified through the righteousness of Christ. So we're going to stop there. Um, there's a bunch more that we could talk about with just verses. And I, I, I guess I'll probably bring that up briefly before we move into the next one. But this final statement here of, where was it? Oh, I'm way off on this. Um, until the words of God will be fulfilled. So he's, at this time, he's giving these kingdoms over. He's giving this kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. So again, this is that timing. There's going to be a final timing for this stuff. And I'll look at some of those verses. They're laid out in your notes so you can look at them. I'll try to wrap that up next time. But we are, wow, we're way out of time again. Um, <laughs> I'm doing really bad at time management. I need that analog clock back. That digital one just doesn't give me a scale, you know. I know it's over there, but I'm not going to look over there. <laughs> Too lazy. Um, well, let's just, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. I keep shortchanging us on, uh, on hymns. I do want to, I do want to tell you this too. I have come up with a, uh, I'd love to do this. I, I have come up with a responsive reading going through Revelation. So like, 
having a leader read something, then having the group read something back, and then singing a hymn. And I broke up the entire book of Revelation, not that we would read through all of it, but I've got just some selections that then we would, we would have somebody read, have all of us read together, and then sing a hymn somewhat related to that. I don't know if you're interested in that or not. I thought it would be super cool. I've already given it to Brad to see if he could sort something out. He's not convinced we can do that in an hour. Um, so we'll have to figure that out. But if there is interest in that, would you let me know so I can let him know? Because if we have to block like an hour and a half out or something like that, I don't think it'll be like incredibly long. But um, I just would like to know if there's interest in that or not. Um, I don't know if we need like a full-on production thing. I was even thinking maybe we could have Kelly just do acoustic guitar and sing some stuff. So if you have some ideas on this, would you please come and talk to me? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plan on doing this at the very end here uh, where we basically just finish up this whole question and answer in Revelation and then just sort of wrap it up with song because it's such a cool book of praise and song. I thought it would be a fun way to finish it. So if you've got any ideas on how to, how to do this or what you want to do with this, you know, maybe we'll just skip an entire preaching service and do this. <laughs> uh, just let me know. Just let me know. Um, that's right. Well, let's close in prayer and we'll just uh, let you guys get out of here. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given us the ability to repent through your son and the blood that you've poured out, that you have made a way for us to come out of Babylon and be part of your people. And God, I just pray that you would help us, help us as people within a nation to turn this nation back to you. Help us be faithful to proclaim your word. Help us be faithful to speak out uh, and proclaim the things that you have called us to, to say. Lord, we ask for repentance for America. We pray that you would open people's eyes and that a move of your spirit would be great at this time because we need, we need your spirit more than ever. God, we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's